what is it like to share your story, not once, but twice? Being a subject of a documentary and writing a book, we're talking to Justin Early next. You are tuned in to Black Hollywood Lives, breaking into. So beautiful. Yeah. She's very underrated, yeah. I think. Yeah. She's one of those those that she's been around a long time. Yeah. And yeah, she comes from a famous father and all that. Yeah. But she's underrated. Hello, you guys. This is Breaking Into. We are back after a two week hiatus, and I have a great, fascinating show for you today. I'm your host, James Lodge Jr. You can follow me on all social media platforms at James Lodge Jr. I mean, it's so simple for you. Follow me. My guest today is a fascinating guy who I've known for a long time, and I'm glad to bring him in here to share him with you and his story. He embodies my motto, of course, which is paying it forward, sharing knowledge, and lift each other up. It's just amazing. He was one of the subjects of the Oscar-nominated film documentary back in 1984. Was, he was like, you know, we're only a few years ago, right? <laughs> yeah. Called Streetwise. And then in 2013, he actually released a book called Street Child, a Memoir, and it is no holds bar, folks. He talks about everything. Mm. And I read it, because I'm showing you, let me show you the book right here. This is, you need to go get it. You don't have it, go get it. I made notes, I read it. It's a great book. It's, uh, I've been a fan of his strength. I've been a fan of his bravery to share his story, not once, but twice. It's my buddy, Justin Reed Early. Hey. How are you? I'm good. Welcome. Oh, well, thank you. Welcome to the show. So, um, first of all, I just want to say to you, it's just an honor to have you in here. Thank you so much. Okay, I mean, because, I mean, I say bravery and stuff, it's, it's true. Because we all have stories. Mm. We've all been through things. We don't always share it out in the public sure. or be part of a documentary that shares your story on, in public mm. either. So, I mean, your life, I mean, it must be a weird, because you have a private life, obviously, and then this public part. How do you, all these years, work that out? Well, um, that was a long time ago. Yeah. <clears throat> and I wasn't one of the key subjects yeah. of the documentary, right. so uh, it hasn't really followed me around. Um, I still remain close with a lot of people that were, oh, good. you know, starring subjects of the documentary. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I just, you know what, I, I try to just have a balance in my life. And, you know, a lot of times I won't talk about my book and I won't talk about the stuff that's in there and the history of my life just because it's, you know, i got to be yeah. really careful of what I share. Depending on where I'm at, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's a good question. It's, it's, you just brought me. That's why I love <laughs> these conversations. So, if you meet someone, friend or otherwise, potential AOIs, do you, do you tell them they have a book or no? If they don't know already, how do you navigate that? I don't. You know, I don't bring it up anymore. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people, more than I, you know, wish to <laughs> you know the book. Obviously. Know about it, but yeah, um, yeah I don't. I mean, I just kind of let things happen organically. You know, if there's a subject that, you know, is a part of a discussion where I think it's appropriate, I would, you know, I would absolutely mention it, but yeah, I don't like so you still, So you still treat, you treat your life like many of us who don't have memoirs. Right? You treat it the same way. You meet me, we, we, things unfold as they unfold. Yeah. yeah. Just happens you have a book. If they want to yeah. shorthand or some stuff, they could go to the book, obviously. Yeah, yeah. This is very interesting, because I mean, I one day want to write a book one day, and I was like, wonder what that would be like to have that out there. Because um, the book also has hope in it. Mm. Too, and we're going to we're going to talk about that. But first, about the documentary because that was a long time ago. I saw it back then, and I was like, because I'm around, we're the same age. We just right. realized, yeah. And I remember seeing because I love documentaries, and unfortunately, you didn't win because of another brilliant documentary, Harvey Times, of Harvey Milk, was yeah. the one that won that year. I mean, great documentaries that year, obviously. Yeah. Um, it was raw. Mm. It was sometimes funny, mm. maybe not intentionally. It was kind of funny. Something was funny. Um, it, it stood out. The documentary stood out for me in many ways, like Paris is Burning, mm -hmm. and what well, in Harvey Milk. I mean, there's certain documentaries that always stood me because you follow certain people through this journey in the documentary. Some things happen that are bad. To some of them, yeah. I think of Dwayne, of course. Yeah. Some things happen that are kind of a little bit like okay, a little uplifting, and then some things seem the same. Like it's just like it's just a slice of life. We're not gonna solve it like a Hollywood movie, right? You know. So how did that movie? How did that documentary come into your life? How did it come to your orbit? Well, you know, at a very early age, I had uh, experienced homelessness and became part of a group of homeless children in Seattle, Washington. I was involved in the system. I was a ward of the court. So I had gone into foster care, receiving homes, group homes, and uh, had been become part of this crew that hung out downtown, in downtown Seattle. So, yeah. um, you know, uh, they had actually come down, Mary Ellen Mark, who was a famous photographer. She recently passed away last yeah, year. Yeah. Um, and uh, she came and did a article for uh, Life magazine, 
We're like Hydro Life. That's not even called, around anymore. It's called Streets of the Lost, yeah. and uh, it was actually a, just it just hit home with a lot of Americans, and it was yeah. a really big story. And um, she actually ended up coming back with uh, Cheryl McCall, who's also passed, and her husband Martin Bell, and they shot uh, Streetwise. Yeah, yeah. It's just, I mean, we're gonna just, let's, show, let's show a little clip. I'm going to show you the beginning. I have a, a comment about kind of the beginning of the documentary, so let's just show a little clip of that. <laughs> I was acting up. Can you show the pictures? Oh, oh, one minute. I don't say, can you show the pictures? Maybe we'll start with the pictures. So, yeah, cause, cause what I was going to say with the documentary, as we're waiting to put it up there, mm -hmm. um, it, the music was kind of jolly. It was like showing downtown Seattle. Everybody's like dogs walking and people and kids. And then it opens with the scene I'm what we're going to show where, he's, where one of the kids is asking for money. Yeah. It seems like it was almost kind of like a jolly thing. Like, oh, this is regular. This is downtown Seattle. But yeah. no, there's something else going on right. too. And that's what was so interesting. And I think that's what made it such a powerful film. And the, I mean, the depiction of, I mean, it was really an unbiased view of yes. these lives. It was unscripted. Yes. Uh, Martin and Mary Ellen came in and they just, you know, bonded with everybody and they really just hung out with us mm -hmm. and documented exactly what was going on. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that for some of the kids that once they got on camera, they were, you know, <laughs> yes. a little campy. But, you yeah. know, they really were able to capture the essence of what was going on. I agree. And that was what was so powerful. And that's why it was nominated for an Academy Award. I mean, it was such a heart wrenching story. Oh my God. Let's tell people who don't, who may not have been around yet. Or maybe forgotten. Back then, reality was reality. Mm. Think of there's you know there was a there was a reality documentary was considered the grandfather of all American Family. Yeah. With Lance Loud and all that, and that was like I mean it's there was no there were like nowadays it was cutaways and edit and the way you edit it like right. with like your documentary it was like here it is I yeah. mean there it is. Yeah. There was none of this kind of stuff they do today. So these things were for real. I think now are we ready to show the clip? Okay. Let's show the clip. I love that rhythmic. Yeah. Spare some change, ma'am, so me and my father mm. could get something to eat. No, I don't, sir. All right. Why not? Say so you're my father, man. No. All right, then get lost. I got to make some money. Mm. Living downtown, a typical day was I'd get up at 12, um, take a shower, get something to eat. Then 3 o'clock, I was on my Robin Street, start robbing people until 6, 7 o'clock. Yeah, then I'd go get my drugs, get my food, get my whoever I was going to sleep with for that night. So what's up? <laughs> So that's what I wanted to kind of show people. If you guys have seen it, you can see it. I mean, you need to go see it. I mean, it's, it's, you can get it online. You can see it on YouTube. It's, I mean, it's all over the place. Um, but again, it opened up kind of like this. So it's like a nice regular day in Seattle. And it really is a nice regular day in Seattle, sure. right? Sure. And that's going on. And that's going on. And it's going on all over America. You know, I think that there's a concentration of homeless kids in Seattle that has been, you know, kind of diagnosed, but... You know, that's going on all over the United States. Well, look at that. I see, I used to live in San Francisco. I did for 16 years. Yeah, and yeah. it could be San, it could, it could be parts of Los Angeles. It could yeah. be parts of New York, Chicago. I mean, it's like, when you see that, I knew Seattle, because Seattle's very distinctive. You can see things, but you, it could be any city USA. Yeah. But I think that was what was so intriguing for Marilyn Mark and Martin Bell. They were like, this is the cleanest city in, right. in the United States. <laughs> right. What are all these kids doing out here? Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> they saw something in that, and they wanted to document that and just to talk about, you know, some of the deficiencies, even in, you know, the perfect city in the world, yeah. you know? Yeah. So. God, that's, I, I, you know, I had a kind of rough childhood, but I did, I did have a place to live. That's mm -hmm. one thing I did have. <laughs> um, and I just, I, I have no concept of what it's like to be on the streets. Or, or a ward of the system. Right. Can you give me just a little bit of what that was like for you? Just kind of like, like a, just an average day of like, what was that like for you? Well, I think, you know, the feelings kind of went all over the place. There, there was a certain level of excitement because, you know, when you're young, you want to be grown. So there's a, certain, yes. there's a certain <laughs> aspect where you feel grown and you feel like you can do whatever you want, yeah. you know? So you feel like you're on top of the world. Okay. But then there's also, there's also times and situations and scenarios where it's scary and it gets lonely 
and I missed my family. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. and you know, again, I came from a pretty average middle class family. Okay. So um, a lot of people that uh, were on, that I was on the streets with were very disenfranchised, mm -hmm. and um, so you know, I say that because the alcoholism that was in my family and the violence that was in my family played a big part on why I left, you yeah. know? So yeah. you don't have to be disenfranchised to have that level it's, of a breakdown, good. Yeah, you know? Yeah, good, good point. And, um, but, you know, it's, uh, in retrospect, uh, it was really scary, it was very lonely. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you just, you wake up every day and you're just looking at the next thing. You know, you're not really looking into the future. You're not thinking, oh, I need to go to school so I can do this. You know, yeah. I think that at a certain point in my street experience, I knew that I wasn't going to make it to the age of 18. I mean, I was just wow. convinced that I wasn't going to survive that long. You know, wow. once drugs became a part of my story, oh, there you, go. you know, it's, uh, it was pretty, it was pretty tragic and pretty destructive. So, um, but yeah, it's, um, it's a horrible life. I mean, you make the best of it. And, and I think that, that, uh, they cap captured that with Streetwise. Mm -hmm. I mean, we goofed around. You we, did, no, you did. We joked. Yes. We had, uh, you know, very strong, loving bonds. Yeah. But we were living a life of trauma. I mean, there was a lot of sexual assaults going on. There was a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of unacceptable uh, situations that, you know, we had to experience every day. Yeah. You know. I want to show a couple of pictures and just get you to see what you think. When you see these two, these two pictures, of course, are just our famous. They're out there. I mean, when you look at him mm. now, at almost you know, in your late forties, what do you what do you see there now? Hair. <laughs> you got a beautiful, beautiful head of hair too. Look at that. It's all like how's you get like that? It's all nice and right? roofy. Yes. You know, I just see. <laughs> and then, yes, I like that. in the face in the facial expression, I see the pain. I see the. Just ambiguity of of that day, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a trip. I look at these pictures and I think, oh my gosh, if right. I, you know, you could talk to him. If I could talk to him, right? Yeah, that's what I thought when I saw. It. I was like, God, I wish I could talk to him right now and yeah. say, okay, here's how this is what you, this is what can happen. This is your, this is your choices. Here's because, what we're gonna do. Yes, you know? right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Can you show the next picture, please? This is another one that's kind of famous. It's out there. I, oh, yeah. First of all, I love the boom boxes. Yeah. I remember them, and I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> they're, they're bigger than you guys, but that's yeah. funny. Um, what do you think when you see when you look at that? Now? I was 12 in that picture. Because you were so, the youngest in the documentary. You were, right? You were one of the youngest? I was one of the youngest. So, yeah, I think I was actually even younger than Tiny, yeah, I think so, who was the star. Yeah. Yeah. So I was actually 12 in this picture. And if I'm correct, and I don't remember, I'd have to ask Martin Bell about this, but I think that this was shot when they did the life magazine oh okay okay yeah so Mary Ellen took you know tons and tons of pictures um but yeah that was my boom box I love that boom. I love them I used yeah. to have I don't know where mine is now at this point but yeah I used to love them be worth some money now god wouldn't they I mean we didn't know that back then obviously we didn't pay attention yeah. but it was like what wow. is but I just I just think it's a great shot first of all just, that's why I wanted to show them they're great shots and they're out there people can see them everywhere and but it encompasses the life on the streets in yeah. Seattle. I mean, you know, it was usually rainy and dreary and yes. gray. And that's really encapsulates that in that one picture. Yeah. I always wonder, um, for me, I always wondered, I mean, the nighttime can be rough, but I always wonder what the daytime was like for people who are homeless or on the streets. Would that be the hardest in some ways, more than night kind of? Or it no? depends, yeah. I mean, you know, you wake up and you're like, oh my God, I gotta do this again. Yeah. You know, right. I got to do this again. And then depending on where you're sleeping, are you sleeping in a doorway that you got to move from? Wow. Are you sleeping under a bridge where, you know, somebody's wow. urinating next to you? I mean, you know, wow. the, the, there's various, you know, places yeah. where you would stay. I mean, a lot of the times we stayed at hotels or motels, you yeah. know, because, you know, we were dealing with, um, you know, the street lifestyle where hotels were a part of the existence, especially for prostitutes. Yes, and there is that in the film, of course. Yeah, and they would let us stay in the rooms. And, you know, yeah. once they had a room, you know, a lot of people would just be able to crash. Oh, so, yes. Yeah. Well, I always tell people, cause, you know, I know it's like to struggle and be on your own as an adult, a young adult. Um, I left home and went to Green, tried to go to Green Year Pastors and had to mm. eat potatoes every day and mm. borrow stuff from people and sleep on couches and stuff. I've done that before. And I've always said to this day, I always know that we're all one situation away from homelessness. Yeah, we are. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. One injury. I know people who, did, who were doing great yep. had an injury. Yeah. They sent them to so much debt they can't. They lose their home, their yeah. car. 
So yeah. we should never take it for granted. We should never take it for granted. I mean, you know, it's such a disconnected population that it's really hard to get, you know, the hard data and real specific data. But we do know that 20 to 40 percent of homeless youth are LGBT. And yes, we know that up to 40 percent are African American. And those <sighs> yes. are numbers that are just unacceptable. They're staggering. They are they're staggering they are, they are unacceptable. unacceptable. They are. So, there are, you know, you, you see in the numbers that the communities that have been targeted and disenfranchised and disempowered and oppressed are experiencing homelessness at, you know, alarming tra rates. Tragic al alarming rates, yeah. Yeah, so. I know. I do stuff with the Trevor Project sometimes. When we yeah. talk about that. It's just, it's, it is sad because I see, I have done, I've done workshops. Um, I've talked to some of the kids who are between 14 and 17. And they see no future, like you just yeah. said. I mean, they, you try to tell them about it. And you're like, and you can do this, and you can come in all jolly, and like they're just like they really, they really don't see it. Yeah, it's scary when you're that disconnected. Um, it's hard to be inspired, mm -hmm. you know. And that's why I wanted to write the book is I wanted to really inspire that child or yes. you know, young adult or even adult that's really out there and that's really at the bottom of the barrel you know as far as addiction or whatever you know yeah. so i wanted to be as raw and real as i could be i'm going to read something from the book that i that I, that I really enjoyed that we're going to talk about the book now okay okay make sure i got it marked Juan james Lott jr pull together there we go <laughs> okay i really like this so i'm going to talk about this this is his words i made a decision when i woke up this morning as I typed this very word, to tap into the good that the world and universe have to offer. Mm -hmm. And I offer it back in as many ways as I can. I highly encourage readers to give back and be of service in and outside of your respective communities. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Be a mentor, deliver meals, volunteer at a professional level, or donate financially to a nonprofit organization. Your intention, your action, and your contributions make a powerful difference. It will also help guide you in a direction that you may find edifying. Mm -hmm. These activities have played a significant role in my corrective and reparative accomplishments. Mm -hmm. That whole paragraph I, I marked out, it, I love that. Because it, it said to me after reading the book, this is toward the end of the book, you, you wrote that in there. It was like, you do believe there is some hope out there still. You're willing to go of service from your experience. Mm -hmm. And also, you suggest to other people, this is not just your story. It's a lot, there's, a thousand, there's probably millions of stories similar to this. Go out there and look for them and help them out. Yeah. I, lo I love that. I, I wonder, I love that. <clears throat> well, and I'm just reiterating spiritual law. I mean, yeah. cause and effect. I mean, we hear it every day, and it comes in different, you know, forms. Yes. And, uh, but we hear it every day. We hear it with Oprah and Deepak and the meditation series that they do. And we hear it every day. Yeah. Wayne Dyer. I mean, this is just stuff that is, you know, repeated and it needs to be repeated continually. You know? but I think because it came from you, from your situation, if you read this book, all the situations you've been through, it almost seems, I no, no offense to Oprah, I don't want her killing me or anything. Mm -hmm. um, it just, because uh, she can hear everything, I'm sure. Because <laughs> um, she's Oprah. No, I mean, coming from you, it just seems almost a little more powerful to me mm. because you li you literally have lived it and you still have hope. Mm. Or you're still at least looking. And you said, that's why I say you see like that, this has helped you. Helping other people has helped you in right. your own process. Well, you know what, too? And I think that, you know, I have to repeat that to myself every day. Oh, I'm sure. That doesn't come naturally to me. Okay. You know, I think that once I got involved into the addiction and, you know, it really did something to me where I have to remain aware yes. and I have to be reminded on a daily basis that that's the direction that I need to go. So it's really important that, you know, I say that to myself every day. Yeah. You know, I, I don't have the luxury of having that encompassed in my being. You know, there's a lot of people that I know that are spiritual and oh, they yeah. do, and they're just Zen all the time yeah, like, and they can meditate yeah, yeah, for 24 yeah, yeah. hours. Oh, and, I'm not all that either. But yeah, yeah, you know, and I'm, I'm not that guy. Yeah. You know, I really need to be reminded. I'm sometimes like a little kid and I need to be reminded 10, 15, 20 times yeah. that, okay, slow it down. What are you doing to help others? Because, you know, I am operating in a world that has laws, there's spiritual laws. Mm -hmm. And if I want to have positive results in my life, I need to be putting forth that positive energy and, you know, intention. So 
Yeah. Well, you're not. Well, you're saying basically there's no thing such thing as perfection. You don't have to be perfect. I mean, at least if your intentions are there and you're trying, that's the least you can do. I mean, that's really good. Yeah. I mean, we just need to put forth the effort, especially now. You know, I mean, that statement is so powerful with what's going on. Yes. With you know the shootings of yes. you know black Americans. That's you know it's so disturbing and so upsetting that you know we I've been sharing this on Facebook and I know that we're yeah. on Facebook and yeah. we're friends and you'll yeah. see me and I'm posting about yeah. Black Lives Matter yes. these are things that I'm passionate about now I'm a little more connected to the black community than maybe a lot of my white family or mm -hmm. white friends but yeah. <clears throat> you know I really want people that aren't connected to start voicing their yes. outrage you know yes. I have a vested interest in the black community you know a lot of the people that are my chosen family are black you know, and it would break my heart to have to experience what I witnessed on a live Facebook uh, video yesterday. Yes, I know we saw it. Yes. So, you know, but I want the person that maybe doesn't have a lot of black friends to just stand up for, you know, our brothers and sisters because, you know, that's what we need to do. I agree. I always say that, you know, um, our allies, people who are not us, so to speak, they need to start joining in. And that's when real change will happen. And I've noticed it's really quiet on Facebook from a lot of my... White family who I love and respect, and right. you know, I don't think that any of them are racist. I just right. think that there's a lot of, <clears throat> you know, ignorance when it comes to you know these these issues, and we do need to be vocal, and we do need to we do need to march, and we do need to. I was listening to NPR on the way up here. You know, we do need to organize and you know make some people you know inconvenient with traffic and you know not you know violent well, in know. any way, oh, but we need to you know. Well, you and I come from an era where, I mean, I said I was in San Francisco from, like, 89 to, to I mean, I was in the, in the trenches when HIV and AIDS was happening. I mean, I did many marches. When Matthew Shepard was going, I did yeah. march. I mean, like, I come from a generation where we marched. Yep. We got out there. We were a little inconvenient. I mean, that's just like, you know, I'm sorry you couldn't. I remember, I remember recently someone was getting mad because last year at Ferguson people were, I, I couldn't get to the airport. But I'm like, well, there's a little inconvenience there. Yes, I understand that. But it's like we're getting killed and things yeah. are happening. And It's just like when they shut down the Bay Bridge, act yes. up. You know, I mean, yeah. I have friends that were in that. Me too. Well, you me know? too. Yes. And, you know, I'm sure there were a lot of pissed off people uh, I'm that. sure. No, I'm sure. And you know what? It changed lives and it saved yes. lives. And yeah. there are a lot of people that are alive today because of that incident that mm -hmm. sparked a lot of other incidents, you know? Mm -hmm. A lot of civil unrests yeah. that happened over the years um, have made effects and changes. Yeah. yeah. And I think, and I'm, just, I'm hoping this younger generation really pulls it together and I takes so the too. torch. I do. I know I some who too. are. I know yeah. some who are yeah. and some who aren't. Yeah. But I know some who are. Yeah. And I, I'm hoping. Because we were doing it, and we're you know we're getting a little older, and we'll still probably go out there and do it too. But I wanted I want the young ones. It's their world. Like, what world do you want? Well, you know, I did the candlelight vigil uh, for Orlando, and that's okay. just another thing that we. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're just being bombarded, and really, yes. you know, uh, you know, I keep saying we need more love. We need more love. Well, we need more love, but we need more action. We need more action, and we really need to, you know, step up, be vocal, march, and you know, find some solutions. Yeah. Get some no. solutions. Yep. Sometimes being loud is the best way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. <laughs> now, in the book, you talk about a couple of things. Now, one of the <laughs> things I want to ask about just overall, was it really hard to revisit some of the stuff in this book? Oh, yeah. I mean, how did you push through it? It was intense. It was I'm intense. Sure. I, you know, had a lot of uh, supportive people Good. in my life, including my family. My cousin, Diana, was <laughs> instrumental. Go on, Diana. Yeah, hey, Diana. That's right. Um, she read it chapter by chapter. You oh, know, wow. I would finish a chapter, and she would email me and say, where's the next one? I need okay. to see it, you okay. know? And um, so she kind of inspired me through it, and so did my friend Eric Chisulo in, in Oakland. He he was like, oh, my God, I need more, you know. <laughs> and he gave me a lot of really great advice, too, and he helped me, you know. And I actually did some research. I mean, I actually interviewed people that I grew up with or yeah. people that I interacted with. I interviewed my mother, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. No, the book, is, the, it, was a, it was a great read. Um, and what I like about it is you really paint a picture. Um, like, like, I felt like I was voyeuring in. Some chapters felt like I was interrupting or intruding mm. reading it. Mm. I was like... Ooh, should I be reading it? Like, it's like, it felt really just like, should I really be reading that? Because I kind of know how he is now, and it's kind of crazy. And I, you know, and I did, and I did like chuckle a couple times, because it's kind of like, this is really some stuff he's sharing, and 
but that's a good book. I mean, it's like, I should feel uncomfortable because... It's, it's risque. Yes. For a professional. I'm a professional. Yeah, I, mean, I know, I know. In, I know. A, in a corporate environment. You, know, you and, do talks and stuff. You all do, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, it was definitely risque. It has created problems in my life. Oh, it has? Oh, yeah. There's oh. definitely people who are judgmental about it, you know. Uh, okay. But, you know, I know that at the end of the day that this will be part of my legacy and that it it's already helped, you know, yeah. a lot of people. And, I mean, I've gotten emails and have interacted with youth that, you know, had been contemplating suicide or, you know, have just re-enrolled in school or, you know, I mean, really, we inspire each other through each other. We help each other through the eyes and hearts of each other. So, you know, this, I want everybody to write a book, you know, because we all have something to give, you know, yeah. and this is just a little piece of me that, you know, I had an opportunity, you know, I really wanted to mem memorialize a lot of my friends too. Yeah. Lulu, that. Roberta, all the people that uh, are in there. Yeah. I needed to tell their stories. There was no Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, any of that stuff yeah. um, that we're obsessed with today. Yeah. Um, and they, their memory is not as real as, say, people's would be today. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I really needed to tell their story and make yeah. sense of it and to kind of just, you know, um, have their lives not be in vain. Yeah, I okay, like that. You know? Yeah, I always think it's, you know, um, I'm part of this village mentality. Um, you know, and, and my ancestry in Africa, they were, were in part of a village. Mm -hmm. The elders talked to younger people, and young people did. Everybody had a part to play. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like, you know, you're part of my village here. I have a village here. That's how I say my fans are my village. We're all in this together because whatever one of us does something, it does affect the others, yes. whether you know it or not. Yeah, it does. It's like a domino. I mean, we are all connected, you know. Um, we're all connected. Right. So it may be happening over there, but that effect could happen. You, you have no idea what it's going to do a year later or a few weeks later where you are. Yeah. Maybe at the same say, I mean, I, I've had rifles pointed at me as late as two years ago. Oh, that's scary. Here in L.A. Just One of the scariest things in my entire yeah. life. I had a SWAT team on me in West Hollywood. So I know mm. what it's like. Mm. And I'm not, I'm not some young kid with my <laughs> pants sagging. You know, I'm, all the things they try to say is what it is. I'm a, I dress just like this on a Sunday afternoon at 7-Eleven, and I was the only black person in the store, and they came at me. And you know what? And the gentleman yesterday that was uh, oh, in the no. live video, he was he worked at a school. He yeah. didn't have a criminal record. Yeah. He was licensed to carry. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm reading about it today, and I'm still just kind of absorbing yeah. it. You know, I have, again, I have chosen family, and, you know, yes. I have a god-nephew who's black, and yeah. he's, you know, got a little anger issue, and his mom asked me to just kind of sit him aside <laughs> and have a little conversation with him. Yeah. So I thought, no problem, this is easy. Start having the conversation. Well, you know, the conversation goes from anger to acting out to possibly having an interaction with police, and I needed to tell him, oh, well, you know, when it comes to the police, because of this, you know, you need to act in a certain different way. That's not acceptable. That's crazy to me. I'm sitting here having a conversation with him and I'm tearing yeah, up and he's yeah. looking at me, he's like, why are you crying? <laughs> yeah. like, what are you, you know? Yeah, what's wrong? Yeah. You know, and I, I don't ever know what it'll be like to be black, right, but right. I do know from my experience of what I've seen in my community yeah. and I just, you know, it's just intolerable. Yeah. It's just intolerable and you know, I've been able to just touch on a lot of issues with, with my book. You know, bigotry is yeah. one of them. Racism is, yeah. is another one. You know, yes. I talk about Frankie yes. and his, his experience. Uh, Frankie's in here. Frankie's in here. I was Frankie's say in that. there. Yeah. Frankie was 15 and was arrested for attempted robbery and was sentenced to 15 years in prison at 15. Yeah. Another kid that I know, that he know, we knew, was 15, was um, arrested for murder and sentenced to seven years in prison. I mean, there's just so many discrepancies yes. Yes. that are pretty... Common. That we're not making it up. And we're not making it up. They're on the books. They're, I mean, they're everywhere. Yeah. Right. We're not so, making it up. Yeah. You know, that's, I think, another life that, you know, I can start to, you know, discuss. I mean, I just, I want to talk about it. I want to help. I want to do whatever I can to help make the world a better place for our kids. Yeah. You know, I shouldn't be having to tell an, an 11 year old he needs to watch out for the police. I know. I know. Is that crazy? It's I crazy. Because I remember when I was a kid in the early 70s I, and I was being bussed out to the valley. <laughs> I had to deal with that whole situation where we still have it's just black people on the rally. Right. Um, I was told when I went home to my parents, they asked me why my parents, because I come from a multicultural family, why my parents are these different colors and why is your grandfather mm -hmm. this and what's that and what does that mean? And having to be told that, okay, well, James, you're black, mm -hmm. so what the, you look this certain way, you're going to be judged a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I was like six years old. Mm -hmm. 
And at six, I didn't really get it mm. yet. Mm-hmm. But as time went on, other incidents happened. I was like, oh, mm-hmm. I get it. I remember I have one incident where I had a best friend, and he was white, and then went to school in Ladera Heights, which is a suburb of Los Angeles, Inglewood area. Um, and he was when the winner of spelling bee every year, and he misspelled a word, and I got it. Mm. I was the first black person mm. to win the spelling bee. Wow. He didn't care. I was not. He didn't sure. care. Sure. I was never invited to his parents' house again. <laughs> oh, my God. It's crazy. I mean, so, I mean yeah. we, we used to have every day, all the time. Yeah. His brother and my brother were friends. We we're all friends, and at that point, we were all the same. Yeah. I beat his son, their son, and I literally, I mean, I had never went to his house ever again. And he didn't understand why, and I didn't, but then my parents had to sit down at nine years old and explain to me why I can't go to Leslie's house anymore. Well, you know, and there's a certain level of entitlement. And, you know, again, it's infrastructural racism. You know, and a lot of people don't, aren't even aware that they have it yeah. until they, you know, lose yeah. a spelling bee. Spelling bee for a kid. <laughs> you know? And it's funny, the kids, didn't care, we didn't care. Like, it wasn't like, sure. it was just like he was like, congratulations. Yeah. So like, for him, it was like, he didn't even look at it as black and white. Yeah. So he's, it's going to be tough. So I don't, really, I, don't, well, I don't know where you are, Leslie, now, but I'm sure he's fine. But I mean, I don't know where. I don't <laughs> well, know he's got spell talk. check now, so he's good. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, it was white out and then spell check. Yeah. Remember white out? That's kind of crazy. Um, I want to mention something kind of fun. And that is somebody we have in common that we knew, and that's Paige Hodel. Oh, my gosh. So, for me, yeah. as I age myself, go back in time, yeah. uh, I met her through some DJ friends of mine in Sacramento. Mm-hmm. I lived there for six years in the early okay. 80s. Yeah. So, uh, I'm not early, late 80s to early 90s. Mm-hmm. And there's a place called Faces. It had just opened at the time. It's still there now. Now it's huge. I remember huge. it, yeah. Um, Terry, I don't know them. Um, and so, I wanted to be a DJ. Mm. So, she... And so my other friends taught me how to DJ. Mm. And so when she would go to the bathroom sometimes, when she played, mm-hmm. I could play a few songs. Mm-hmm. And I, now she taught you, didn't she, she also? Did. Yes, yeah, so I'm like, she did. Talk about, let's talk about Miss Paige for a minute. Paige this is, fun. I mean, is one of the most beautiful human beings. I totally agree. That walks this earth. And I love her more than I can articulate. I'm going to start crying. Yeah. She's really a beautiful soul. You know, she is... Uh, She's in it, and she's just been one of the most loving people that I've ever known. You know, she was a successful club promoter and yes. DJ. Yes. But you know, she's always given back, and she's always given of herself. Yes. You know, she her yes. the something that she does right now is called the Monday Hearts for Madeline, which is just amazing. Are you from, you're familiar, of course? With I that. know some of them. I haven't talked to her in years, so it's like yeah. it's kind of fun. But she yeah. does a heart every Monday. It's a yeah. beautiful heart. She's very yeah. artistic, and she does yeah. it to raise awareness to uh, cancer. Her yeah. her partner. Uh, passed away and yeah. you know every Monday yeah. when she was ill she went and she put a big beautiful heart on her porch uh, so she would open the door to this big beautiful uh, heart because that's who Paige yeah. is. You I know? loved her at the box in San Francisco. Yeah. The box every Thursday night was the bar. It was I all house it. music yeah. and she it was, it was she put it together and it was her club, her yeah. kind of her night and first it was at the Independent over on the Visnero, yeah. and then it moved over to South of Market. It was like this huge production. Yeah. And I used to love it. I just, I mean, I haven't seen her in so many years. Hi, Paige. I haven't seen her in Hi, years. Hi, Paige. And, you know, DJ Paz. Yes. He yes. was. He taught me how to play, too. And so did Lily Tran. Remember Lily? Yeah, I remember Lily yeah. Tran, yes. So we all played at the box, yeah. Well, you amazing. know, I don't remember in San Francisco, there was CD Record Rack, which was on 18th oh, yeah. Street. And it was all the DJs. Like DJ Phil B is yep. a friend of mine. I love Phil. Yep. I love Phil. I still know him. He's yep. my longtime David friend. Harness. David Harness. David and, Harness. Uh, yes, yes. I know all of them. But we used to always go there. And, Every Tuesday for, super, for a new release Tuesday and see all the mixes and yeah. um, that was such a great time back then. And so I was kind of funny when you mentioned. I'm like, oh my god, I know yeah. somebody from there. It's so funny. Okay. But I mean, so DJing. What does DJing bring to you? What does it do for you? Uh, there was a certain level of escape, yeah. of uh, inspiration through house music. You know, house music is a spiritual music. Yes. It is yes. an uplifting music. It can sometimes be a campy, kiki music oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and fun, but it's always been uplifting to me. It's very similar to gospel. If you don't know what house music is, it, there's certain a, a gospel element to it. You know, that's why mm-hmm. yes. you hear somebody say, "Oh, we're going to church, yes. we're going yes. to the club to hear house music." Yes. You know, and uh, it's always been uplifting for me. Yeah, you know, it's funny uh, in San Francisco. Uh, like I was there 16 years total, so in San Francisco, I didn't really DJ there or anything. I just I got the regular jobs or whatever. But I went out a lot. Yeah, <laughs> had a good time. <laughs> um, but um, they had a thing called Fag Fridays, and I don't want to say fag anymore. But it was called Fag Fridays at the end up. It was Dave, a big. It was a big. Was, Dave yeah. and Jose. Yes, it was, yeah. a, it was a big thing, and yeah. that was a part of the name, and we yeah. all accepted it. Just want yeah. nobody get scared and be mad at me. Yeah. Um, but I remember that um, we play. They play until Friday until Saturday morning, and I would go for that. And I remember a Saturday morning. Um, there a lot of times they would play right when it became like sunlight would come up. Yeah. Um, they'd play Sounds of Blackness, The Pressure. Oh my God. There's a remix of that is so just like Frankie totally, Knuckles, which is totally church. It's all church Frankie and Knuckles, like yeah. you know. And they also yeah. they were a gospel group that they yeah. remixed them or big for a while. And Nesby. 
Anne Nesby. Anne Nesby. Yeah. Yes. She, her voice is amazing, of course. She is amazing. But her, Martha Wash, all of them. They played that song after Frankie. David Harness, actually, I was in San Francisco yeah. at Oakland uh, when Frankie Knuckles passed, and uh, David Harness did a party, and he started with the pressure, and everybody on the dance floor was just crying. Just crying. Because, it's, it's a, because again, I mean, to be honest, I mean, Frankie dying was obviously a big deal, but it's like it's a song that yeah. really. It just it, it brings you to church. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. You don't go to church, I mean, it brings you there. And the pressure is talking about the pressure of yeah, life. It's yeah. talking about the pressure and you know the inspiration. I mean, yeah. you know, it's it's a beautiful yeah. song. So. Do you like music today? Do you I like do. dance music today? Do you I love still like dance it? music. I love hip hop. I love R and B. Yeah. I love you know pretty pretty all over the place. I think I tend to gravitate more towards. R and B and you know just because I'm older and yeah, I was say because we're jazzier young. but yeah. you know um, yeah <laughs> I was gonna say because as I, I found my taste started changing I'm not as yeah. I'm not as bouncy as I used to be in yeah. my music yeah I actually I used to love the beat of the you know the yeah. subwoofer you yeah. know <laughs> and I still do I mean sometimes. five minutes at a time you know I have to turn it down I'm like oh my head you know but yeah <laughs> I never thought I'd be that person well you know it's funny I went out not too long ago I just don't go out very much at all and I went out um, after leaving here one night with a friend of mine. We said, let's just go have a drink or whatever. And it was 90s night. Where'd you go? Uh, Mickey's. Okay, yeah. And I know people there who work there and yeah. stuff. But they were just, it was just like, I hadn't gone out in like a year. <laughs> and it was just, but it was like, it wasn't crowded because it was a Monday night, so yeah. it wasn't crowded. But they were playing all this 90s house music. I was like, oh my God. I feel like my parents would always say, that was my jam. That was me. <laughs> They're classics now. They are. <laughs> well, when, when K Earth 101 here in LA, Shows start to add 80s to classics. Oh, Lord. Here in LA, Chaos One Ones were on front of you. was always 50s, 60s, 70s. Yeah. When they add the 80s, all of my friends and I started to like time of death. We're in trouble. Yeah. We're getting old. We're in God's waiting room. <laughs> yeah. It's no joke. Uh, the struggle is real. Oh, my God, it is. And you also, he also adds song lyrics in his book. You always I have did. song lyrics all throughout the I book did. that has something to do with the, the chapters I see. The time period and the chapter yeah. and the feeling of what yeah. I was feeling, you know, I've, I was able to feel my feelings through music, yeah. you know, and I think that is what is so important about music. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for me, you were told to not cry, to not do this, yes. to not feel, to yes. not be authentic, to not be gay, to not be black, to not be whatever. <laughs> you know, I was able to live and dream and be inspired through music, so it was a big part of my life. And I always was, say music saved my life in many ways. Totally. Completely. You know, yeah. It's that song, Jesus Saved My Life, but like seriously, it, it did. did. <laughs> no, I mean, like, seriously, yeah, it, it did. did. Yeah, it did. Yeah. It did. Um, talking about that, I want to talk about a little bit, because we have another thing kind of in common. I had friends, and I've done some work with them, Walden House. Yeah. Um, I've had one of my best friends come out of Walden House. I met him right after he came out, and I gave him his first job in San Francisco. Mm, love it. I gave a lot of people their first job in San Francisco. That's a theme of mine back in the late ni- mid to late 90s. I was I giving people it. jobs. I used to work at Headlines. There was a place that was, in, that was big in San Francisco. It's gone now. No place like that. Um, I remember headlines. Yeah, we we had like five or six stores. We went on yeah. Polk Street, yeah. went in downtown. I, I ran the stores. I did the wow. I was there like five years. It's kind of crazy. Uh, no, I was one of Castro, one of Castro. Um, so you you just you described Walden House really well, actually, in, the, yeah. in your chapters. So tell people what Walden House is first of all, if they don't know what it is. Walden House is a behavior modification treatment mm-hmm. program. Um, back when I went in, I entered in May on May 29th, 1991. So okay. I was 20 years old, 21. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the 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 mo- model was a little bit different back then. It was a little more confrontive and okay. behavior modification mm-hmm. and therapeutic yeah. community. Um, I think it's kind of relaxed over the years, but it's still a very effective treatment program. It's called uh, Health Right 360 now. Mm-hmm. Uh, they merged with Haight Ashbury yeah. Clinic in yes. San Francisco. Yes. Uh, but, you know, I'll never forget the first day when I pulled up. You know, I was just a little lost child. Yes. Um, I had gotten arrested. I was in jail. Yes. And they gave me an option to go to Walden House. And I said, yeah. you know what, I think I'll give it a try. And they came and they picked me up. It was May 29, 1991. And they drove me up to Walden House. And when, they, when I got out of the car, I looked and there was a sign that said, today is the first day of the rest of your life. And that moment will never, ever leave my mind. Wow. It's, it wow. was just such a profound... It was an epiphany for me. Yeah. You know, it was it was one of the first things that allowed me to, to in, in words, it was poetic. Mm-hmm. It was uh, inspiring, and it was, you know, I was like, oh, my God, there's hope, you know? There's, so, it's really funny. That phrase is such, phrases like that, when they have a time, all these things are, they seem so, like, simple and, like, more like, sure, of course, but they really do for people who need to see it. Yeah. They yeah. need to see yeah. it. And you know what? You could tell me something today that wouldn't even strike me as, right. you know, 
uh, warm and fuzzy. Right. Tomorrow I might be going through something and you say the same thing and it would just be profound, you know. So, sure. you know, I really believe in, in those types mm -hmm. of, you know, open your eyes, listen to lyrics, listen to poems, put your own words together. Yes. You know. I, yeah. I completely agree. When Ferguson stuff was happening last year, I wrote my first spoken word pieces. I ended mm -hmm. up writing about 30 of them. Wow. I was angry. Yeah. And I wrote them. I wrote it out. Good. I had to find a way, and, I, and I'm a writer, but I never, I always thought, spoken words, somebody, yeah. somebody else does that. Yeah. No, obviously, we all can do whatever we want. Yeah. And it was actually a great thing to write out. Good. I felt, I felt really, felt really good. I felt better after it. And everyone good. should do it. Everybody should do it. You know, or whatever whatever your thing is. Right. You know? painting or singing. singing or, yeah. Yeah. Get Working out. out. Right. Get it out. Yeah. I need to work out. I'll say, because you have a nice little body in there. So do you, oh. work, do you work out still or no? I do. You do? I try. What I, mean, is, I tried what is, today. Today was pretty lame. <laughs> I was kind of embarrassed. People were looking at me like, what are you doing here? <laughs> like, on Facebook. You know, I was angry today. I was. I was angry today. Yeah. And I'm still angry. Yeah. And I'm fired up. Yeah, I don't and, blame you. You know, and I'm going to keep saying it and posting yeah. stuff on Facebook. Do it. I'll say do it. Pissing off people. I tell people, this, this is why I tell people also, you can just steal this from me. This is my famous thing I always tell people. My Facebook page is not a democracy, it's a dictatorship. <laughs> right. <laughs> Say it all the time. I told my friend, made fun of me the other day. He's like, really? He, he emailed me, I posted something. I'm like, well, if you don't want to say anything about Orlando, you know what? Just delete me. I don't even want to be your friend. And you know, yeah, it was a little bratty, but yeah, I meant it, yeah. you know? <laughs> and my friend it? said, uh, he texted me, he's like, are, are you going to make me delete you? <laughs> But, it's like, but to me, it's like your face. You, you can do whatever you want on Facebook. That's your page to do with whatever yeah. you want. Yeah, my favorite is All Lives Matter. Yeah. Don't come at me with All Lives Matter. No, no, don't not today. That either. No, yeah. no. <laughs> we're talking specific. Not today. Yeah, Being specific. So we're not talking about everybody today. Um, I had a, a, a former guest come on who made who changed my view on homelessness. Mm. Um, he was. We, you know, we see a lot of it here, especially in San Francisco. There's a lot in San Francisco too. There's a lot in San Francisco. Um, and we talked about it, and he said he changed his view when he started realizing people basically want to be seen and heard. So you see that crazy person walking down the street or, or that homeless person who just decides to walk across the traffic and mm -hmm. stop it by just walking slowly. Mm -hmm. there's, there's something in that. Mm -hmm. Like, don't forget about me. I'm still mm -hmm. here. And that changed my view on just the whole notion of homelessness. And they have a right to be here. Yeah. You know, and that's what I think a lot of people don't understand. We get, we're 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 empowered and we're inspired and we're made to believe that we're unique and we're wonderful and we are wonderful and we're amazing and we deserve success. But at the end of the day, we're not better than anyone else. I like that. You know, and uh, and it's hard for me too. You know, I get inconvenienced every day with people walking in front of my. You know, it's like, what are you doing? Like, come on, I'm in a hurry. Right, right. You know, I was beating traffic trying to come here. Like, right. You know, but really, you know, sometimes we just need to take a deep breath and just be aware of our surroundings and just be aware that you know we are surrounded by people that are us. You know, and well, you know, we're also we are the traffic. Yeah, we are. I look at that. I'm like, I look at that. I'm like, well, we are the traffic. Yeah. We're in traffic. We're upset, but you know, I'm in the car too. I mean, so I'm contributing to it. Yeah. And that's just interesting. I mean, as, I'm learning as I get older to look at things a little differently, and it's just very. And I see that you are too, looking at things differently, or at least striving to, of course. By the time I have it all figured out, it's gonna. I'm gonna be dead. But but that's how it's supposed to be, I think, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, if education stops, um, then yeah. then nothing's gonna be here for us. So I'm gonna keep learning. I wish I end. had everything that I have now, <laughs> 25 years ago. Kind of, can you imagine? Yeah. Even though I would never want to be younger again. I don't want to be younger. I kind of I don't mind this age so much and how I look at the yeah. moment. But I want the knowledge that I have now. Ah, I agree. Because you just you just because yeah. you learn yeah. stuff just by living. You learn stuff, and you also and I, I want to just bring this up briefly because I'm just curious how this worked out. Okay. You were homeless in New York City I was. for a time. I was. New York City. I mean, like it's a harsh. It's harsh. World harsh weather. Yeah. I mean, how I mean, how did I mean, how did that look? I mean, how was just like. You know, New York City. Um, responds well to homeless. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's they, good to they know. They have shelters, and you know, okay. again, they're scary, they're dangerous, but you know, they do try to offer you know um, uh, shelter for people that okay. are on the streets. I mean, those are those are dangerous temperatures in the winter. God, I, I know. mean, people will freeze to death. Literally, literally yeah. freeze to death. So yeah. you know, um, it was scary. I mean, my phone's ringing. Who's calling? <laughs> me? Okay. He's busy right now. He can't come to you right now. So when you watch this interview, you'll see what he's doing. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it was scary. Um, and, uh, 
But you survived. I survived. You did. You survived. You know, yeah. Okay. There's something. There must be something in you because we all go through things, and I've been through some horrific things myself. But I, I'm still here. Mm-hmm. Some folks aren't still here. Mm-hmm. They go through some of the same things you go through, and they don't make it. Do you have an idea now as you've been working on yourself why it is you've just kind of stuck around? Do you think? Do you have any ideas? Everyone has a purpose. Everyone's existence has a perfect purpose. I think that, you know, a lot of people who have left us have left us for a purpose. Okay. You know, I think that, um, you know, a lot of the people that I talk about here that their lives impacted me and their deaths impacted me. Mm. Um, You know, I get to share their stories. You know, I know Lulu's stories touch a lot of people. Oh, yes. You know? And uh, she was one of the original um, people from the Harvey Milk era. Yeah. You know, she was an out lesbian. She was a protector. She was loving. And um, she was authentic. She was you a know? character. She, she was, was a character. character. Yes, she was. And she was real. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And um, people know who she is today because of, you know, that. Yeah. It's, you know, it's hard to find people who, whether you like them or not, that are real. Mm. That are they just they are who they are. When you meet them, you're like, oh my God. You get on my nerves sometimes, but I'll give you one thing. You are you are right. who you are. Right. I always strive to just like I just want to be who I am. Yeah. Regardless of what people yeah. it's like you're the same way you're working towards just being who you are. Yeah. And you know, again I have to have balance. Like I can't yeah. be too real in a professional <laughs> environment or I'm gonna get in trouble. <laughs> yes. But <laughs> yeah. yes, you I know what I mean? Know. Yeah. I mean look, we all have our, you know, funny moments, but yes, we you do. know, uh, really, it's just I'm trying to be authentic and you know, live a real life. Yeah. You know. I know I have I have a tongue, so I have to be careful. Mm. I got it from my grandmother. May she rest in peace. Aww. She had a mouth. When she died, they're like, "Oh my God!" One of the mouths of the family died. The other one's right there. That was my girl, mm-hmm. Arthuretta. Go on, Arthuretta. That was my girl. That was my girl. <laughs> I love. She was my homegirl, and, and, and I can almost start crying because she was one. Of my, she was somebody who just loved me unconditionally, mm. and then she was actually my great grandmother. And we were super close. She grew up in New- she was in New York. I was in California. I go back to see her. She come out to see us, and it was just like it, we had we had this connection. Mm. And you know, she was from the islands in the Caribbean, and she was just like this. She just she was like four foot nothing, and just like <laughs> her eyes were horrible. She wore coke bottle glasses, yeah. and I got her eyes too. But she was who she was. Mm. And I remember I had a trip. I went there. I was like I was in my early twenties, and she fell, mm. and she had to, she had to be in a wheelchair for a while and stuff. And they're like, "Well, James, you gonna cancel?" I'm like, no. I had more fun at home, girl, than I did mm-hmm. with my grandfather and them in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. She was like, we're going to the store, we're going to the restaurant, we're going to do this. She talked, flirting with people. I mean, like, she didn't care. Yeah. And they told her, don't make any more brandy because it'll hurt yourself. She had brain until she died. Like, oh, screw you. Yeah. She had a glass. Yeah. She didn't overdo it. She had a glass. Yeah. I think mean, kept her alive for 20 years, probably. <laughs> my mom. <laughs> my mom loves her bourbon. And your mom, you, talk, you talk living about your mom, so I mean, that's, that's something that you had to, I guess, had to really work towards. Yeah. Getting to a place where you and your mom yeah. could be okay. Yeah. That's a that's a that's a big deal. Well, you know, both my brothers passed away when yes. I was in New York, yeah. so uh, I became an only child. Yeah, I never really reconciled with my father, but I've always kind of kept a relationship open with my mother. Okay, yeah. Uh, one of the most defining moments in my life was when my father got sick with cancer. Yes, yes. and I really wished for him to suffer. Wow. And I lived with that feeling for about a day. Oh, okay. And I woke up and I was like, "This doesn't feel good. Like yeah. it was hurting me to feel yeah. that bitter and that angry towards my dad." So, you know, I reached out to the people in my support community and I decided to do something that was unthinkable to most and that was to show up for him and for her and to help him guide him through his process and through his transition and, and, and forgive him. And that was really yeah. one of the most defining moments of my life yeah. and freeing moments of my life. I would say, I'm sure. So, you know, because of that, my mother and I started, you know, talking much more frequently. And then when she became a little you know, when the house became too much for her to live in yeah. on her own, she gave me a call and, you know, I helped her pack up her house and she came <laughs> to stay with me temporarily in Inglewood yes, down in Ladera Heights. Heights. Yeah. <laughs> and she never left. So she's still with me, you yes, know. Yes, that's cool. And it's been the most wonderful six years in my life. Yeah. You know, yeah. the the beginning time was a little scary. Oh, we didn't I'm know so, who each I'm other sure. were. Oh, I'm sure. She didn't know she could trust me. I mean, right. I had, you know, the story, you know, yes. and I didn't know I could trust her. And yeah. she's really one of the most beautiful people that I've ever experienced in my life. See? My mom. And I'm so glad that I get to have that now. Yeah. You know? It's kind of, it's, it's really interesting that, you, again, you give hope to people saying, you may not be close with your parents in certain parts of your life, 
but it's not over. Mm -mm. If you don't want it to be, it doesn't have to be over. Forgiveness is key. Oh, when yeah. I see people holding on to stuff about their parents, it, it's it's painful. And that's just from my experience. Me too. You know, yeah. I held on to it for a long time. Oh, so me too. Everybody's got to go through their process. But I know for me, getting to that point, which took a lot, uh, was probably one of the most, you know, distinctive moments of my of my healing. So. Well, I'll tell you, I, something I learned on Oprah, and she was good, forgiveness is getting up to hope the past could be any different. Mm. When I learned that, it will change my whole life. Mm -hmm. Once you give up, the, I mean, the past is the past. Whatever happened, happened. It is. You really can't go back and do it. Yeah. My, your father, my father, all could say they were sorry, and it might feel good for a moment, but you still can't change what happened. You can't. It's beyond that. Yeah. And, you know, my friend says, you know, just because I forgive you doesn't mean you get your job back. <laughs> right, right. You know, right. your old job back. Right, no, right. You know, and that's true, too. It is true. You know, but, uh, you know, there's just a certain like sense that. of relief that we get when we forgive others, and it's, you know. Yes. Yeah. So we're coming to the end of our interview, of course. That was um, fast. I know. You have to come back wow. again another time. Yeah. Um, we can talk some life coaching stuff. Um, I asked two questions. I asked my guests every okay. same two questions. Okay. And as you guys at home, you know, I do not prep them ahead of time. I ask them on the spot these two questions. I believe in language. Uh-oh. Language okay. can change. Okay. Language can uh, propel you forward or hold you back. I'm mm. big about that. So what word in the English language do you think we should take out? Do we take out? Not say anymore. Take it out. You had the power to do that. Can't. That's a good one. Let's get rid of that. Just don't, don't say can't. Try it. See what happens. Yeah. See what happens. Can't. It may not work, but just try it. Yeah. Now, what word do you think we should bring back into the English language or say more of, or maybe it's not being said enough? Mm, that's good. I know people, people always like that one. It was like take one out. Always have like, what do you what would you say more? Of? I know. Work. That's what I do when you come here. Mm -hmm. Wow. Make you drive here, then make you work at the Gosh, end. You know, um, I'm. You know, it's got to be love. Okay. It's got to be love. We need more love and peace, and you know. <laughs> I just really, I just think that sometimes, you know, and, and I'm guilty of this, is that, you know, sometimes when I get around warm and fuzzy communication, I feel, oh, that's cheesy, oh my God, you know, the Oprah, Deepak, oh, whatever. Yeah. Oh yeah, come on, spare me. But I think that we really need to, to bring it back and, and really just be able to talk about the warm and fuzzy and, you know. As I get older, I find it's less cheesy. Yeah, it is less and cheesy. Isn't it interesting? I'm fine. As I get older, I'm like, oh, I was hardened and everything when I was younger and I'm finding the opposite. We do need more love, actually. Yeah. Just in so many different ways, we need more love. Yeah. I think it would solve a lot of things. I think so, too. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. And yeah. the book is called Street Child of Memoirs. So you have to go getting it on Amazon, everywhere. Just get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. You'll be not surprised. Streetchildmemoir.com also. Tell folks in that camera where they can actually find you online. They want to talk to you. You can find me online. I'm on Facebook, Justin Reed Early. Uh, my website's uh, www.justinearly.com and I'm also on Twitter, Justin Early. That's right. Yeah. Now, our Facebook page is called Breaking Into. You can go on there. Please like it and follow us. Have, this interview will be on there and all the others that I do. I believe your, interview, your show number is 33 or 34. Congratulations. So thank you. I've been doing this. I'm coming on a year not too long it's from amazing. now. Amazing, so yeah. Kind of, it's kind of fun. Um, and also, you can follow me at James Lodge Jr. The hashtag is Breaking Into on Twitter. I love you guys, and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Kevin Undergaro, Dario Kristen, Gianna Hopkins, and the entire BHL staff, we would like to thank you for supporting Black Hollywood Live, the first online broadcast network dedicated to African American entertainment. For questions and comments, contact us. Info at blackhollywoodlive.com. Like us on Facebook, tweet us, or Instagram us at BHL Online. And I am the official voice of Black Hollywood Live, Scipio, Instagram, at KingXOBay. Thanks for tuning in. The views expressed here are those of the whole song and do not necessarily reflect the views of BHL or its owners or principals.